folks. Welcome to From Tip to Tail, a podcast highlighting amazing animal rescues around the world. I'm Sydney. And I'm Bridget. Today we're speaking to Skip from Southern California Bulldog Rescue, an organization who provides the care and time needed to prepare unwanted bulldogs for placement. So for a long time, we've been fans of the work that Skip and the SoCal Bulldog team does, and we're so grateful that he could take the time to talk to us today. Uh, so let's get started. Hi, Skip. How are you today? Fine. How are you guys doing today? Doing it's been good. good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so, um, I mean, we've been working together for a really long time, um, just um, through Cuddly, uh, but I guess we've never really gotten into how the rescue started and how you got into everything. So um, we'd love to hear um, how SoCal started and how you got involved. And um, yeah. Um, you know, we, we've been around for a while now, at least 15 years. Um, we've, we kind of grew out of another rescue program. We were affiliated with a show dog group, the English Bulldog Show Group which had a smaller rescue program at one point. Um, rescue isn't really a, a show group's focus. Um, so it, it wasn't looked on favorably. It wasn't really cultivated. And those of us that were involved with the rescue kind of spun out of that group to set up a more public rescue program. Uh, that its primary goal was rescue, not showing dogs. Uh, we have no interest in showing. We have no interest in breeding. And it's not that we're against breeding, but it's just not the primary thing that the rescue uh, is interested in. Yeah, because I know bulldogs, I mean, as I think everyone's such a big fan of bulldogs in general. I mean, they're so cute and they've got those like big personalities, I think. Um, but um, but I mean, I think at least what, from what we've seen, it seems like they have a lot of like maintenance that comes along with that. Right. Um, exactly. It's it's a lot of people. Um, they don't recognize or understand that bulldogs are really a, a man-made uh, breed, left onto their own with natural selection. Uh, the bulldogs would not exist. Um, natural selection calls for the healthiest and the fittest to survive. And we see those with German shepherds and pointers uh, the, the mutts that we all love, they're the survival of the fittest. Bulldogs don't reproduce naturally, uh, if, if rarely at all. Uh, they have C-sections. They need humans' help uh, to give birth through C-section. Wow, uh, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, it, it just doesn't happen naturally. It's rare that you hear that my bulldog accidentally got pregnant by my other bulldog. Um, if a bulldog gets pregnant by another dog, it's usually a more athletic dog that was able to have the stanima uh, to for the reproduction action to happen. Um, but it is a man-made breed. It, it needs man to exist and care for it in the early stages, uh, starting from conception up through the puppiness till it's at least you know 16 weeks old, or it wouldn't survive. Yeah, wow, that's that's incredible. <laughs> um, and it sounds like you've got some bulldogs in the background there. <laughs> are those your personal pets or are those rescues? Um, I'm fostering a, a young dog right now. He's a bulldog mix. He's a, a puppy, we think, old English mix. Um, and then I have my own personal bulldog next to me snowing at my feet. <laughs> well, and then is your foster going to be available for adoption? Yes, it will. Um, should be for adoption in the next month, month and a half. He has a couple pending surgeries coming up. Oh, really? Um, what kind of surgeries? Is it like kind of more typical things or does he have um, actual like larger issues? <laughs> uh, one of them is typical. Uh, all our bulldogs before they're adopted out, they're spayed or neutered. Uh, in this case, this young boy is going to get neutered. Uh, so he'll be sterilized before he's adopted. And in the other surgery, it's kind of a classic bulldog issue. He has double cherry eye. 
It's uh, oh. comes out of the uh, the corner, the inner corner of the eye on the bulldogs. Uh, there's no understanding why that really happens, other than their heads are shaped a little differently with all the extra folds. But he has double cherry eyes, so those need to be removed, and that's a kind of a common surgery on bulldogs. Oh yeah, and I mean we'd love to promote your adoptable pets in the show notes here when we promote this. So I I, I know it, bulldogs are kind of hot commodities, and I'm sure you have a process for getting them adopted out. But we'd love to promote your adoptables for sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, Cuddly does a lot for that. I mean, just getting them on your your fundraising site, we get a lot of people who follow up. They they donate and they they'll send private messages or they inquire. You know, after dog XYZ is taken care of, we'd like to hear more about her or him for adoption. So it's it's not just fundraising you do with Cuddly. It's reaching out to people and they see the dogs for adoption and they ask. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's our favorite part is watching these people join in your community and kind of follow along. And then in the end, I know, uh, was it Holly that ad adopted a dog that she was donating to as well? Um, one of our one of our major donors like followed along with the story so much so that now she seems like she's a huge champion for you guys um, and, and adopted one of your bulldogs. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple people like that. There's another lady named Anne that adopted from us that's a, a big supporter of rescue. We've gotten quite a few big supporters, loyal supporters um, through Cuddly. And, you know, that just speaks to how great your mission is, though. You know, I mean, it's easy to be a, a fan of your group when you're doing such great work. <laughs> so but um, that being said, I mean, I know there have to be so many challenges to what you're doing. Um, so I'd love it if you could speak to that a little bit. If you could talk about, I mean, I know you're always going into shelters and whether or not you have enough hands to help or, or what exactly are your biggest struggles in rescue, do you think? Historically, the, the, the problem for rescue has always been, you know, volunteers and fundraising, um, having enough volunteers to go to the shelters, enough volunteers to foster, uh, enough volunteers to make doctor appointments. Um, the current problem with uh, COVID, uh, for better or for worse, a bright thing that's come out of it is that we have more volunteers now that are offering to foster. And I think we're seeing that in all the shelters and all the rescues now. I just read an article where two of the LA shelters are consolidating and closing their offices and shelters for the time being because they've had so many dogs adopted out. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I've, yeah, I feel like we've seen those little stories come out and it's like, it's nice to see like a little bit of a silver lining out of all of this, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, we got to find some, something bright with it, and people are making good use of their time. Um, so we do have volunteers for fostering, which is nice. Um, and unfortunately, we we can't get into our vet offices right now. The mm -hmm. vets are all on uh, cut down hours or cut back hours. So the volunteers aren't able to go in simply because the vet offices won't let us in right now. Uh, they have the same concerns as the rest of us about getting sick or contagions. Yeah. And Skip, your, um, your organization is a foster-based organization, right? Yes. Good nine, a good 80% of our dogs are fostered in private homes right now. Aww. And would you be able to actually, um, just because I, I don't think a lot of people are aware of this when it's a foster-based organization, um, a lot of people don't realize that rescues and shelters don't necessarily have a, um, a set of space or a a location or a property where they can house these animals. So um, could you maybe take a moment and just sort of tell our audiences about the importance of fostering and, and sort of how critical it is to you maintaining the rescue that you do and, and keeping saving animals or bringing them in? Uh, absolutely. Um, well, fostering or foster homes are really the backbone for rescue. Um, without a foster home, without a place for a, a rescued dog, in our case, the bulldogs, to go to after they're picked up from the shelter, rescue has nowhere else to go. Um, we have to get the dog out of the shelter into a safe space uh, where there isn't really a, a clock ticking for the dog mm -hmm. to get uh, treated uh, or adopted out. Uh, so the foster homes offer that safe space for the dog. They're there to take them in for a day, a week, a month, 
sometimes for three or four months a foster mm -hmm. home is with a dog making sure that the dog is safe getting fed getting water walked making regular vet visits which a shelter can't do a shelter has a limited amount of time and a limited amount of space yeah definitely Definitely. I know during this time too, I was fostering a, a little set of kittens and what I really loved about it was, and they were only with me for a few weeks because I fell so in love with them and I took so many adorable pictures of them, mm -hmm. of them and got to know their personalities. So I was really able to help them get adopted because I was able to get those, like I spent so much time with them. I, I got their best light and I got their best personality. <laughs> and so because of that, people who were coming on to, to whatever site it was that where they were adopting out the pet, they were just struck by by how um, cute the pets were in the picture. Because I know that's a, especially when you have so many animals in your care, you maybe don't have time to like do an hour long photo shoot. Whereas I'm trapped in my home during COVID <laughs> and I'm like, I can do a day long photo shoot. So, so I know I, it, I mean, for me, I felt so honored that I was able to get involved with these kittens lives and, and I was actually able to help place them in wonderful homes where people were just so smitten by them. And as, as a foster too, I'm like getting these follow-up photos from the adopters. Like, Aww. look how happy they are now. Like they're all curled up and nuz nuzzled with their new home. So it's, it's a very sweet process to get involved in. Definitely. That's, that's a real important thing too. I mean, some people, you know, if, if you search around on social media, you see some foster homes actually have created entire pages for their foster animal. Um, they, they're telling the dog or cat story mm -hmm. out there, talking about their day-to-day -day experiences or at least their weekly experiences and kind of really putting a personality with that photo. It, you can always take a cute photo of a bulldog. It's not that hard to do. <laughs> but given that personality, the likes, the dislikes, the funny little things, that the bulldog does really helps find a home for the dog and mm -hmm. a foster home is the best way to do that a foster home is to whether or not a dog likes a squirrel or comes across a cat <laughs> and like the cat or dislike the cat or uh bark at the mailman mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's cute little funny moments that really sells a, a dog to somebody Definitely. I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it sounds like you have, a, you're, so you're have a foster in your home right, right now. Do you typically have foster pets in your home? Yes. I always have at least one <laughs> foster dog with us. Um, it's, it's why we really got into rescue. My husband and I is that we wanted to foster and help the dogs. And we can't imagine a point where we wouldn't have at least one. And right now we have two that we're watching. Oh, it's so adorable. Um, is there anything in particular about bulldogs themselves? I mean, uh, there's so many breeds out there. Was there anything that drew you specifically to the bulldog breed? I don't I don't think there's anything that drew me to them other than, you know, just my own natural love of, mm -hmm. of dogs. And it was having the experience with a bulldog and kind of identifying with their personality. They're so easy <laughs> to clean and um, they don't require a whole lot of exercising. Uh, they don't need to go for mile long runs or anything. And that, that really kind of appealed to me. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are a bit of clowns. Uh, <laughs> the big goose. Yeah, definitely the family breed. You know, they, they were bred to be part of the family and part of the family companion. And it's what I wanted. I wanted the dog to live in the house with me and be a family member. And I recognize that some other breeds aren't really as good, uh, wouldn't fit that for me. Mm -hmm. uh, German Shepherds, Pit Bulls, beautiful animals, but they need a lot of exercise and mm -hmm. a lot of outdoor time. And I don't really have that time for them. Definitely. I definitely understand that. But uh, so bulldogs, I mean, they may not need to be run, but I mean, certainly they require a, a bit of care. I would say maybe more care than, than an average animal. So I'd love to hear a little bit about maybe what you look for when you're adopting out some of these dogs, um, what you tell people about what it means to bring a bulldog into your home. Like what, what does it look like? What does grooming look like? What, is, what does it mean giving the best care to these bulldogs? 
You know, we have a discussion with a, uh, an adopter. About half our adopters are previous owners of Bulldogs. Mm -hmm. so they, they know what they're getting into, and they, they're already used to the idea that they're going to have a routine that they're going to do with their Bulldog, um, that they're going to be controlling the diet and how much the dog eats, um, kind of forcing or encouraging the dog to go on some regular walks and getting some exercise. <laughs> I think I need someone to do that for me. <laughs> yeah, a mini coach. You're kind of a coach for a bulldog. Um, with new adopters, uh, what we're looking for and what we want to share with them is that this is, isn't is just a, a dog that you're going to not have to do anything with. It's not mm -hmm. turnkey. It's a dog where you really are going to pay attention to the dietary needs of the dog. Um, that your dog can easily get overweight, which creates other problems for the breed. Um, that cleaning the ears, mm -hmm, uh, the, 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 the things that we uh, don't normally do for other breeds of dogs is something you have to help a bulldog with and do. It's part of that maintenance. Um, the, uh, the most obvious thing, for example, is their ears. Their ears are floppy and down, so they do get dirty quite easily. Uh, whereas other breeds of dogs have pokey ears that stick up in the air and they don't get as dirty because they dry out. Hmm. Oh, wow. Well, so, I mean, so how long have you been, you said, have you been with SoCal for, for 15 years? <laughs> yeah, I'm one of the founders. There was a group of three of us that founded the original rescue. Uh, we were the board members. And then there was a following of about 10 other adopters that joined on board. So the original group of about 15 people is still around. Uh, we were all adopters of bulldogs and felt that rescue just needed a higher profile. It wasn't a secondary thing. It could actually be a whole important issue unto itself. Definitely. Well, so you've probably seen so many animals come through. Has there been one that like has just struck a your struck your heart strings a lot um whether it be like their whole story or just like i don't know won you over <laughs> yeah uh you know the first dog that we had in rescue his name was taz um oh, he came into rescue he was abandoned in a uh parking lot up in the victorville area and um oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, new subject. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, there are so many of these stories too, that, I mean, I think it's, it's easy when you see like from our platform that there are so many in need, but I mean, people who are picking up these animals, I mean, they, everyone gets so involved and so invested and they're opening up their own personal homes, bank accounts, everything is, is mm -hmm. getting taken from them personally. It's, it's not necessarily like this well-oiled like uh, machine of an, of a company necessarily all the time. A lot of these pe rescue people that we've worked with at least, I mean, they've really taken from themselves to give to these animals, which yeah. is just so amazing. I mean, and being able to, I mean, you, you can, you can see the difference too in these animals' lives and in where, how, where they end up from where they started. I know for us, like we, we love a good success story. We love, <laughs> we love seeing an animal. Well, I mean, right, we, the transformation. Absolutely. Yes. And I mean, being able to see them like with a loving home, running through a field for the first time, <laughs> it's, it's such a wonderful thing to, for us to be a part of in what little capacity that we are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so I know um, with COVID, we, we've kind of talked a little bit about what you've, <laughs> what impact it's made on your organization. Maybe we could talk a little bit about, I mean, have have adoptions have been to a standstill with you? It sounds like you've got a ton of fosters now, although, I mean, I'm sure we, we could always use more, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, the, the big change for us with uh, COVID, because you can't meet people face to face anymore or be standing with them. Um, adoptions and uh, the part of rescue where we would normally do a home check in person has come to a standstill. We've gone to a virtual model now. 
uh, virtual with phone calls. So if someone comes to adopt a dog now, we're giving them a phone call. We're discussing all the important points about rescue and trying to get a feeling for them over the phone in the discussion. And then we're following up with a virtual home check, either through Skype or videos, to get an idea of the home environment where the dog's mm -hmm. going to live. Um, our big concerns in a home check is, you know, what's the main living area for the dog like? Is there a fence around a swimming pool? Um, mm -hmm. Is there an adequate yard or an outdoor area for the dog that's safe? Is there a fence around the yard? Um, we're finding that we could do that all with video now and kind of still move forward with uh, the adoption. With the adoption. Yeah, and the foster home, so that's working well too. And then we're still meeting with people, but it's a, a shorter meeting. It's uh, less human, um, less humans involved with it. You won't meet three or four people. Uh, if you're adopting now, you're going to probably meet one person, the, the foster parent that has the dog. And you're going to have a respectable distance from each other and make sure everyone's healthy when you're meeting. But that... Uh, that's a new world for us now. It's a new normal for rescue. So we're learning how to work with that. Um, it does slow up the adoption process mm -hmm. for us. Um, it, yeah, it sounds like you're you're doing what you can to make it yeah. work, though. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're trying to be we're trying to be open and trying to find ways to get the dogs out. We're still getting owners surrenders too. Dogs are still being. Yeah. We're doing it with, again, with videos and applications and phone calls and then having to stand in the parking lot at the vet's office and have a vet tech come out to pick up the dog, um, uh, observing the six-foot distance. It's, it's more difficult now. It's not easy, but we're finding ways to work around it. And I think it's the new normal for us going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Well, I mean, so... Being in rescue for as long as you have, I mean, <laughs> you've uh, there have been probably some obviously some some trials and triumphs. Um, so, what would you say has been the greatest part about rescuing bulldogs for you? Hmm. <laughs> greatest part, <laughs> you know, um, kind of cliche, but it's the people that you meet. I, I, I really have enjoyed meeting a lot of the people that have adopted. I, um, It's kind of a clan or a tribe of people where you have something in common, uh, something to feel good about, um, that we all feel good about, and it's centered around something quite wonderful. It's a pet in need. Um, I've enjoyed that. Um, That's probably, so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, That's really sweet. I know the dogs appreciate it. They give belly rubs and hugs and licks. Mm -hmm. and saving a life is, you know, very important. But when you find someone else that connects with you at that same, on that same level, um, yeah. that they, they recognize that they're saving a life, they're taking an animal that someone else didn't want for one reason or another, and willing to accept that animal as is. That's, you know, your media is a real special person. There's not everyone out there who wants to do that or be involved yeah. in you know, there's a lot you know, of I love I hearing it's made that. Some really, um, uh, a lot of friendships too. Exactly. I think yeah. my, I I probably have more friends that are involved in rescue than I do friends who aren't involved in rescue. I'm I'm, I'm the bulldog guy. I'm always you know I'm always going to be the bulldog guy. The the guy somebody got a bulldog from, uh, or the guy they think of when they see a bulldog in need or if they just want to ask me about bulldogs, you know, and, and it doesn't bother me at all. I'd rather be known for that than anything else. <laughs> I love that. Cause I mean, I feel like I, we've met so many rescuers and are you, you assume that people get into it because they like dogs more than they like people. But, mm -hmm. but to hear you say that you love the people of rescue so much is, is such a wonderful thing to hear. I mean, it, yeah. And I feel like for us, we've seen, just like the greatest of humanity, like people who are coming together to help these animals. It's, it's such a wonderful thing. Yeah. It's such kind of people. Exactly. I mean, yeah. look at the industry that you're involved in. I mean, you're, you're there because you have to like animals. If you didn't, you wouldn't have applied for the job or 
been affiliated with the organization and then have to affiliate yourself with a whole industry of animal rescue if you, you two really didn't care about the animals. That's what makes it so easy to talk to you guys about it. I know you understand and that you are coming from a good spot for it. Definitely. Absolutely. I love that. <laughs> I love that so much because you don't hear that very often. You just, you don't hear that a lot of people, what they take away from rescue is the human connection part of it. And you're right, Skip. That is, I mean, it's, I mean, in our line of work, we meet, you know, kind people every day. And that's, that's basically what holds what, what Cuddly does. It's, it's based off kind people who, you know, work full-time jobs and have families to take care of, but still find a portion of their time or a portion of their day to read an animal story and to donate towards them or to care for them or to share or to comment or, or invest themselves in, in an animal's life that they've never seen most of the time or, or, you know, ones that aren't even in their state or their county or anything like that. They just, um, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. We get to work with, um, you know, the, the best parts of humanity. We get to work with the greatest people. Yeah. I mean, you can, <laughs> you're bringing together a, a community of people worldwide um, they just have to see on the internet a story of a dog and feel compelled to comment, donate. Um, if, if it's practical and they're close enough, they may want to meet the dog and adopt the dog. Um, and, and that's really far more important than the rescue going out there and, and banging their own drum quietly. Um, the, having social media your podcast and your fundraisers are really important. Well, we couldn't do it without without people like you out in the field doing doing the hard work, I think. <laughs> well, so as we maybe like wind down a little bit here, I mean, there are going to be people that are listening to this that may necessarily may not necessarily be involved in rescue or I mean, they just may be new to this and whether they love animals, I mean, they just don't know how this industry works. So what would you say is one thing that you'd want people to take away from, from talking for, to a rescuer? Um, the, every, I think everyone I know in rescue has always just been someone who's adopted an animal on their own or from a rescue or or somehow affiliated with a shelter somewhere. So I guess what I'm saying is that anyone can get involved in a rescue. There's no special training. There's no special education. I have a degree in marketing. I, I don't have any animal care degree. Um, I have 15 years of experience with bulldogs, but that's everything I've learned on my own. Uh, I think anyone else who wants to get involved in something, they just need to find a rescue that they want to be affiliated with and, and ask to join, ask to help. Wow, that's great. I, I love that so much. I know when I when I took in those kittens, I mean, I don't have any pets of my own. And I remember they just handed me the crates and I just remember being like, you're not going to give me a book. You're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to tell me what to do here. And it's like, no, like you're going to be okay. You got this. Mm -hmm. Like, the, I mean, and they gave me a, a big, um, like a Facebook resource and whatever else. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's like just, just standing up to volunteer is like half the battle in a lot of ways. Like just saying like, yes, I'll do whatever I can. I'll promote you on social media, like even if I can't donate myself, I can promote you. I can get involved in some way. If you need help with clerical work, I can help there. <laughs> um, I mean, everyone has their own skill set, but I mean, if we all come together for the love of animals, it makes such a big difference. <laughs> I think you're right. Absolutely, it's an industry, and not everyone involved in rescue is actually hands-on, where they they have a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a rescued animal in their home. They can't for one reason or another, but they offer their experience, their ex expertise, or their talents to help the rescue. The websites are done by the talent uh, of someone who knows how to do a website. Mm -hmm. You know, feeding a dog is done by me. Washing a dog, I do. I couldn't set up a website if my life depended on it. <laughs> there are people who will volunteer to do that, and it's greatly appreciated. 
Definitely. Well, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I mean, we love your organization. We love what you're doing. Um, yeah. It's been such an honor to to see all these amazing transformations that have happened because of Southern California Bulldog. And I mean, we know that you're such a huge part of that. I mean, it sounds like you've got a great team, but but we know we know you personally and we've seen the work that you do. And it's been amazing to be a part of. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's good talking to you guys. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, we'll talk to you later. We love talking to Skip. He's such a wonderful example of a founder and really shows the heart of rescue. So don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. You can also follow Cuddly on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at We Love Cuddly. That's C U D D L Y. This is Ben from Tip to Tail. I'm Sydney. And I'm Bridget. See you next week.